I know, I know. Upside down. Who knew? I, I don't know how that could have happened, but, you know. It's a shame we'll never see it again because the video's been deleted as well. But, yeah, upside down. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's Andrew uh, and RC. And um, I'm here to do a little update uh, on the Hummer. Uh, we left the Hummer when it was primed and it had a base coat of olive drab on it, or green, camouflage green as half it's called it. Um, now it's obviously had its camouflage paint put on, it's had decals put on, it's got its some yet more different wheels on, and a few bits of body detail to talk about. So, it hasn't got the 50 calibre on, as you can see, it hasn't got the remote control cross turret on, that's separate and is excuse me, still in progress. So that's uh, that's going to come along in due course. But for now, let's talk about what we've been doing with this. So painting first, then we'll get in and have a look at the details. The painting of this has been a chore. Um, I used um, AK Interactive, where's my box? Here it is. I used AK Interactive real colour paint set for NATO camouflage vehicles and this is Premier Paint apparently uh, for the scale modelers world and um, it's been a good and bad mix. I'll start with good, I mean it's not a review of these paints to be honest because I'm an RCA now I don't prep and prepare and deal with things in the same kind of fastidious nature that a scale modeler might but in terms of the colour that these are they are it's absolutely spot on. I, I didn't think I could get a proper three-tone colour blend uh, and, I, and I have. I mean this is this is absolutely on the money. So the great thing about these paints, uh, they are acrylic paints. The great thing about them is they are absolutely colour matched to the standard, you know, that the military use. So yeah, spot on in terms of accuracy. In terms of using them, they're a bit of a pain in the backside. They are acrylic lacquer paints, so you have to have specific thinners for them to dilute them. If you're going to airbrush them, um, I tried them with normal acrylic thinners and they turned to porridge, so that was no good. So I had to get some proper thinners for them, so it's another £7 for the thinners. And it's all just becoming a bit, you know, becomes a bit expensive really for what, you, what you're doing. The good news is I've got plenty left as well, so I was worried that the little paint pots were going to, I was not going to cover this size of, of, of project, but yeah, it's fine. Applying the paints was a problem. The first problem I got into was there appeared to be some kind of contamination um, of my of my bristle brush, which I used to, to rub down the, 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 the thing before I paint it, before I spray it. There must have been some grease or oil on it or something, and that came through all the paint layers I put on, so that was a bit of a bummer. I had to recoat the whole thing with Halford's green again, just to seal all that off. Um, so the, these are very, very sensitive to, to what you've already got on the job, I think. The, the rattle cans are just blaze over everything. Um, and the other issue I had was, was with tone. I would, I would spray a patch on um, and it would, some of it would dry brighter, uh, lighter, some of it would dry darker, some of it would dry. Just, it would, it would do, do a consistency uh, with, the, with the, the paint when I put it on. I wasn't sure whether it was all going to be, the, the, the dark on the bonnet was going to be the same as the dark on the back of it. I, I, I didn't really, it was really strange. And then you recoat it and you get different patches, different places. It just seemed to have a mind of its own. Um, I've left some of it on. I, I had to stop recoating and reapplying because obviously I'm trying to blend the edges in with the airbrush and every time you recoat you have to redo that. So just got to be a never ending process. So I've left some of the issue areas because in the end it looks a little faded, a little sun bleached. That's okay. Um, my airbrushing was okay, not brilliant, but it was okay. Um, did the job, it's all practice, I'm getting better every time, so um, there's, there's, there's patches I wish I could do better, but no one's ever gonna look at it like this, you know, or if they do they'll get my foot of the jacksie and um, it's gonna be on video moving. It, it's perfectly fine for, for, for the job in hand. Um, so that's been cool. I've, I've lacquered it. I've put a gloss coat on to put the decals on. The decals don't come with the tr don't come applied on the truck. You you get a spare. You get a sheet, so you put them on yourself, which is a good little touch. Um, they did have. I did have a problem getting them on here. So what I'll do is I'll let me bring the camera in, and we can now maybe start talking a little bit about the details. 
Right, so I've got the chuck up on a turntable, so you can we can spin it round and get a good look at it fairly easily. Um, so yeah, these decals, they, they, they're the Kosovan forces, I think, K-F-O-R. Um, I wanted them on because they're quite big and they just give it a little bit of a, uh, a sort of time and place, don't they? Um, they putting them on over the doors, which are really, really heavily um, reliefed with this uh, this cross member set up here. There's there's an awful lot of texture, a lot of quite a uh, deep inset on the doors. So trying to put this lettering, this vinyl lettering on. Even though the, the good decals, the good design, you don't just get a big sort of big chunk of carrier film. You put them on and you rub the top and you rub them down, pull the top off and you're just left with the letters. So that's really cool, but it doesn't work over this kind of texture because the lettering goes all wonky and misshapen and you can't read it. It doesn't look like what it should read and it doesn't look level. It just wasn't going to work. So I ended up cutting a lot of the lettering. And uh, they do cut it around the door, incidentally, because it's... Let me just ping this door open. Um, because it does it does go around the door. See the little bit of it here. So they cut, they give you that cut, which is good of them. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've had to cut an awful lot of the, 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 the vinyl to get it to fit and read as it should read. Um, obviously, I really should have could have painted white in the gaps, but... Uh, can't be bothered. So what I did instead was to, to distress the whole thing to give it an idea that maybe it's been on the truck for 10 years, you know, um, and just faded and torn off and so on over time. Um, it maybe looks a bit incongruous at the moment because there's no other real weathering on the truck to speak of, or you, could, you can really see anyway. Um, the headlights I will start with. I've changed those. I've put my own headlights in. Uh, lenses in. They are clear in the box. The, the truck comes with clear lenses uh, and you obviously would have the bulb behind and there you go, which I think would look a bit grim anyway. It doesn't look very good on the videos I've seen of, of trucks running straight from the box because it's a clear lens. You just see the LED behind. It, it really isn't, doesn't do anything for me that. Um, so what I've done is replaced with spotlights. You know the general genetic spotlights you can buy from eBay. Uh, they, they don't click in or anything, they're super glued in, so probably will fall out at some point. They, they're a bit more opaque and I've put some super glue behind them so the fumes, you know the fumes of super glue can make plastic go a bit kind of white and foggy? Well that's what I've tried to do with these. I think I've been more successful with one than the other. I kind of wish I'd bought the, the big one, the, the full fully equipped one. Uh, and then strip stuff out would have been easier than trying to add in the few bits I do want. Hey, you live and learn. Um, <laughs> there was a point with the paintwork where I wish I'd bought the bloody camo one as well. <laughs> I'm like, I can't believe I'm actually just replicating one that I could have bought anyway. Oh dear God. To be me, I tell you, it's a trauma. Right, anyhow, um, moving swiftly on. So that's the lighting setup. The uh, wheels and tyres, that's the other elephant in the room to deal with, isn't it? So, I was going to run 155s on this, as you'll remember maybe from the last instalment. Unfortunately, the 155 rims were fouling on the portal hubs to the point that when you tighten the wheel nut, it was jamming the wheel on the portal hub and not, not allowing it to turn. Um, so that was a non-starter. I then looked at extending hexes to, to push the wheels a little bit further away from the portal hubs but the axle stubs appear to be slightly wider than your standard axle hub, uh, axle stub thing. So in the end, all my, all my other hexes, I couldn't get over the axle far enough to engage with the pin. So that was a non-starter. So I've gone back to the stock tyres, which as I've, I also said, I'm not a great, you know, that's not a great problem. I, I like these tyres. They, they are a very realistic tread pattern for the Hummer. The rims are, of course, now 1.9s, like the standards. Solid. They have a whole bunch of little bolts around the edge, like the real wheels do on the Hummer, on the military Hummers. All the bolts work. They all do something. None of these bolts are cosmetic. Um, they come as silver. I've had to buy black hardware. So that's that's the elephant. I've messed a little bit with the front suspension. Um, in the end, the, the shocks are rubbish. I've decided um, that, that several people have had a look at them online and, and maybe offered some ideas of improving them, but. I can't see how any of it works. Anyway, so the, the shocks are barely... I mean, there's, that's it for the front. 
that's all you get. Um, and it sits kind of halfway. So what I've done is I've I took the shocks off. They sit upside down on the chassis. On the on the they don't they don't uh, attach to the chassis or the um, independent suspension. Independent. There's no. Um, this is all kind of IFS stuff, uh, I think. Um, there's no kind of axle as such, and um, they all sit with custom custom ends on custom housings. So you can't just slap on a, sta a replacement shock, even if it's the right length. Uh, you, you you won't be able to attach it to the vehicle. So that's a bit of a problem. The pistons are so loose in the in the piston bodies that you can't put oil in because the oil will just jet out or drip out if you put the shock the other way around. And um, there, there's no holes in the piston ring inside. So when you compress it, the, the oil can't come back through. So you just end up, you know, locking the, the suspension up anyhow. The only modification I've tried to do is to reduce the force of the rebound. Uh, all I've done is put a little spring. I just put a little spring inside the shock so that when it extends back out, when it comes back out, when the piston expands, there's a spring at the top, uh, you know, between the, the piston and the cap. So it just has a little resistance, just has something to fight back uh, against the rather strong spring that's uh, trying to uh, expand itself again. I think it's worked, I think it maybe just works a bit too well, to be honest, because these are a bit kind of dead. But once it's running, I have to see it running on a, on a video to see whether it's really, you know, that's, that, to me that's a, that's a bit lively. Guys, let me take the lid off, if I can do that without ripping off my new lighting hullabaloo. Um, so what I've done underneath here, um, I've taken out the stock electrics. So I've got a Hobbywing 1080, I've got a 25 kilo servo. Um, there's not a lot of steering through on this. It doesn't have a huge, doesn't have a great, it's not very nimble, <laughs> I guess. Um, but I figured a big strong servo might be useful because it, you know, if it's going downhill, there's an awful lot of weight. Um, and I've put a battery tray in where the sound module and lightning module would normally sit. So. I'm going to put the battery up front, so I've got some batteries coming that are the right size. You can't, they can't be too long because the interior of the truck stops it. Um, I did try to swap the motor for my um, Surpass 550, these are 550 cans, but there is so much stuff to undo and take off the chassis before you can get the motor out, it's not funny. Um, so I just decided to <laughs> just take the course of least resistance and run the standard motor, I'm sure it's fine. So yeah, the battery's going to be up front instead of at the back, which is good. And I'm also going to put some um, styrene in here, something in here to stop the view because, uh, well, if, when the body shell's on, there's quite a height gap. You could almost get your fingers in uh, between the body and the chassis, which is not how it should be. Uh, I don't believe you can see daylight through uh, the back of a Humvee. I very much doubt you can. Let's, um, let's wrap it there, I think. Um, and we'll catch up with this not too long, okay? Maybe, maybe um, I think we've got a, a PG4 video maybe coming from Terry. He's, he's cracking on with his build. Apologies to everyone, we did lose some videos off YouTube, including his PG4 build part one. Um, so there's, there's going to be another, I think, PG video coming along after this one. And then it'll be my turn again, so we'll catch up with this. And the, the, there will be some, it'll have Windows in, there'll be some progress to talk about. Uh, and there's some things to talk about that I haven't done tonight. Um, okay, thanks guys. Catch you soon. Where are you? There you are. You're down there. Oh my goodness, I'm too old for this. Hello. <laughs> there we go. Say hello. <laughs> Alright. See you guys. Bye.